Thank you very much, Dr. Jerry. Good day, everyone. My name is Lizzie Edward Oyinwak. I'm the Director of Human Resources and Financial Matters at African Science Frontiers Initiatives. And it is my pleasure this morning to read the citation of the Founder and the Executive Director of African Science Frontiers Initiatives. Bright Umaro is a Professor of Epidemiology in Respiratory Diseases and Allergology at the Institute of Medicine, University of Gothenburg, Sweden. After completing his PhD in Epidemiology at from Tampere University, Finland in 2012, and a year of postdoctoral post at the same university, he moved to the University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom in 2014, where he worked in a research position until 2017, combining it with a research position at Tampere University. In 2017, he moved to the University of Gothenburg for a tenure track position where he remains until today. His research includes various clinical and population epidemiologic investigations into respiratory diseases and allergy in both children and adults. His research work has resulted in over 200 original publications in leading respiratory, allergy, and medical journals, which all together have resulted in more than 11,460 citations, according to Google Scholar. He is a recipient of over $15 million in grants for his research during the last 10 years. He teaches postgraduate courses in epidemiology and research methods in health and medicine, as well as various research and career capacity building courses across disciplines. Professor Unwaru is an adjunct professor of epidemiology at Tampere University. He was an honorary fellow at the University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom until end of 2023. He is an academic editor for PLOS One and Scientific Reports, an associate editor of Frontiers in Halergy and Editor-in-Chief of ASFI Research Journal. He is passionate about mentoring scientists of African origin, with which he founded the African Science Frontiers Initiatives, a research capacity building platform for African scientists, through which we all are here for this three-day event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with your virtual hands clapping, kindly make welcome with me, Professor Bright Umar. Thank you. All right, many thanks, uh, Lizzie, for that. Um, very encouraging citation. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the time has come. We have time to relax and go into our panel discussion. Um, I have to say that one of the uh, panelists have not found her here yet, um, but let me ask is um, Professor Shokri in the house. If you are here, please just let me know so that I can I can identify you and give you the right for participation in this panel discussion. Okay, I don't see her, but we have to move on for the sake of time. Whenever she joins us, she joins us. All right, so um, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we have this morning. I have seen um, Professor uh, Gituro, uh, Wainana, and uh, Dr. Kevin Arthur in the house. Welcome. Um, I have given you a co-host right, which means that you can unmute yourself whenever you want to. And just for housekeeping, um, during the um, discussion, um, I would like all the panel uh, panelists to um, um, open
open their videos, except if you have um, problems with your um, your network, so that we can see you when you speak. So we are into um, this very uh, important topic: um, ethical innovation, respecting the respected. Well, that may not be a correct English word, but we couldn't avoid the temptation to use it, respectables. And I hope you understand what we mean by that. All right, so um, what I will do now is to read their citations. I will start from Professor uh, Dina Shokri. You have the panelists in uh, front of you, even though she's not here, but if she joins us along the way, we will... Uh, no, we have read um, her citation. Okay, so um, she's a medical doctor and she's a fellow um, of um, the Fermi Institute. She's a professor of forensic medicine and clinical toxicology and a former head of the department at the University of Cairo University. She is also a chair of the Department of Modern Academy of Technology and Information. Um, she is the president of the Central Research Ethics, the Supreme Council of Hospital, uh, University Hospitals in Egypt, president of the Research Ethics Committee, Ministry of Health and Population, Egypt, chair of the Institutional Review Board, um, at the Modern Academy of Technology and Information. She's a professor of human sciences at the New Giza University in Egypt. She's the president of the Med New Mediterranean Academy of Forensic Sciences. She's also, okay, I can see her coming in now. She's also um, the president of the Arab Union of Forensics and Toxicology, which is a branch of the Arab Medical Union. Professor Shokri joined the Scientific Advisory Board of the Office of the Procedure of the International Criminal Court in February 2014. She is a certified trainer in bioethics and certified forensic assessor for the Egyptian Accreditation Council. Uh, Professor Shokri is a roster in GRR and the UN Woman in 2015, she got that award. She's the editor-in-chief of the Egyptian General Forensic Sciences and Applied Toxicology. She was a member of the committee assigned by the Egyptian Prime Minister to issue the clinical trial law um, in 2020 and its executive regulations. She's a member of the Scientific Research Committee at the National um, Council. Professor Shokri has published several uh, books and uh, many, many papers in scientific journals. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we'll have a better uh, member of the panel um, joining us this morning to discuss this important issue. And so that is a citation of Professor Shokri. Professor Shokri, you're welcome to this. Um, discussion this morning. I will come back to you in a bit to um, um, give you the right um, once I finish this citation. So let me go to Professor Gituro Wainaina. Um, he is a professor of business analytics in the Department of Management Science and Project Planning, Faculty of Business and Management Sciences, University of Nairobi, Kenya. He's a business analytics expert in leadership, governance, policy development, strategic plans, development and management, performance contracting, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. He's a specialist in education, economics, and planning. Um, he has a long-term experience in public and private sectors. He was he's a former acting director Act, direct, Acting Director General and Director for Social and Political Pillars, Kenya Vision 2030 um, Delivery Secretary. He's a former Senior Education Economist for the World Bank. Um, he's a former Regional Coordinator for Care International in Kenya. 
is a former deputy managing director and business development manager, University of Nairobi, X Enterprises and Services Limited. He has a long term standing partnership with the government of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, South Sudan, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Malawi, Zambia, Botswana, Ghana, and Nigeria. As well as with the organizations such as UNDP, World Food Program, UNICEF, World Bank, African Development, um, Development Bank, and Council of Governors. All this he has connections with them. Presently, he's a board member of Uwezo Kenya, Yambo Institute of Science and Technology, Center for Innovative Leadership and Governance, as well as the Advisor Innovations for Poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know, if you have been following um, SFI, um, SFI program uh, seminars for this year, uh, you will realize that this is not this is not the first time we are having Professor Gituro Mainana in the house. So he's already a friend of the house. He joined us in March when we're looking at one of the topics on innovation. And uh, after, after this, this morning session, he will also be presenting the workshop for today's boot camp um, workshop. Welcome, Prof. Guturo. Um, yeah, we'll Thank you very much. Soon. Yes. Thank you very and much. Then, yeah. finally, I will go to um, Dr. Mrs. Karen Arthur. Um, she is a lecturer of entrepreneurship and uh, coordinator of the entrepreneurship and training unit at the Center of Entrepreneurship and Small Enterprise Development of the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. He was a PhD and MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation from the University of Exeter in business school in the United Kingdom. He has over six years of research experience. Her work is multidisciplinary and includes studies on entrepreneurship, uh, education, and training, responsible financing, financial innovation, and its governance, loan repayment and capital formation among SMEs in Ghana, developing digital literacy in academia and enhancing sustainable business practices in tourism sector. Um, Dr. Um, Arthur has published widely in her field and uh, she is um, very much aware and, and uh, know the landscape of innovation and that is why we have her this morning so ladies and gentlemen please um, join me to welcome our uh, panelists this morning um, we would like to just see their faces see their faces you can see them there I can see uh, professor Dina Shokri you can say a word or welcome to the people before I start asking the question but I want to tell everybody it's a relaxing time and uh, usually I don't uh, ask hard questions. We'll, we'll discuss some of the things that affect you bet. us. As, you as you bet, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, all right. So this is what we have this morning. And then uh, we have, um, we'll have, um, at least from now, we have uh, around one hour to get into these discussions. We're going to do... Um, this morning. Sorry, I have my questions on the last screen, so I will be looking through while we go we go through this discussion. But let me go back to my presentation. And uh, our our panelists, I like this this um, definition quite a lot from the University of Oslo. Um, is what is innovation? And it says innovation is new ideas that work. Innovation consists of processes that lead to a new or improved product or measures that will improve services or solve societal needs. Innovation is about adding value to society. So the first question I have, and I will go through the panelists one by one, are you happy with this definition? Is anything missing from it or do you think you would like to adjust some things from this definition? Let me start with you, Professor Shokri. What, what do you think? 
Yeah, I do think it's um, yani quite uh, inclusive for the points we are going to uh, to discuss. Okay. Professor Gituro, I need to see your video. I see your video is off now. I want it back. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Do you it's do a, you bit, like that one? Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit chilly in Nairobi. Uh, okay. So that's why I'm dressed this way. I, I probably would uh, step back and perhaps start with the point. Uh, the last statement, if you can bring it back, what you have just put there. The last statement is very interesting, and I like it, perhaps. That's what I like. It really say, and I think we should, and it's not a should, we must. Innovation is about adding value to the society. It can't be anything else. Value, positive value. I would probably add positive value to the society. Positive value. value. Yeah, and that is important uh, in terms of that. Uh, what I'm not quite sure, uh, do we, can we just look innovation per se, or we have to kick in creativity? So that's something yeah. to think about the team. But I like the last shot where we're adding value to the society. But let's think about, because creativity also is a part of innovation. The two actually talked to, together. So that would be my take, uh, Brian, and I think it's a good definition. All right. Okay. Dr. Karen, what do you think? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I I think I agree with the point about creativity. That that was one of the things that came up to me when I saw the definition. Um, I, I like to think that innovation is creativity in action. So creativity creativity. Right. Is an input for innovation and just saying maybe something new or improved may imply some creativity, um, but it may help to be explicit about that. Um, and um, once that happens, I also think maybe um, the innovation could actually go beyond products. Um, it could go beyond processes to include other things um, like even the business model um, that you are using, or even markets, new markets, um, commercialization or new ways of using something. So you may not necessarily have a new product um, or a new process, but you could use it in a different way. And so the outputs um, could, could also vary a lot. Um, so yes, this is what I would add. Yeah, I, I want to add something Karen has put here. If you allow me, Brilliant, it's important that uh, uh, I think the point, Karen, sorry, Karen, for reading your notes to bring creativity. But uh, uh, the, the point that uh, it, it's sort of driven, it must be driven by something. Yeah, yeah we, we cannot talk about creativity, uh, creativity and innovation. Something is driving it. It's uh, as opposed to bringing it up front, it must be addressing a need within that society to can make that society better than it is. That's how the look at can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, all those yeah. points are taken, and thank you for expanding on this. Um, let me go to the next thing. Um, now this is ethics in research or innovation. Here, um, you have several, and I mean there could be more. Um, several, um, uh, would I call them principles or items or characters of ethics um, in research? Integrity, objectivity, avoiding harm, human subjects protection, confidentiality, openness, beneficence, intellectual property, informed consent, respect, um, respect, I think that should be respect for colleagues, Carefulness, responsible publication. So my next question is, are you happy with this as well? Um, <laughs> is there anything missing? Do you mm. have adjustments? Let me go to you, uh, Professor Shokri. Mm -hmm. um, I do think this is, uh, Yanni, most of the aspects that we uh, have to, uh, to include within the review of the research especially of the uh, human being. 
uh, but beneficence um, um, is considered as uh, uh, the um, the uh, the in, in the current uh, time. Uh, but we have to consider the extended uh, beneficence because sometimes the research uh, ended by a product which uh, carry uh, beneficence to the uh, to the patients, uh, and uh, afterwards they cannot uh, just be maintained on this kind of uh, of drug or medication or intervention, uh, while it is um, carry a quite beneficence to them. So um, I'd like to uh, to add the beneficence and the extended beneficence to the human beings and the human subjects included within uh, the research study. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prof. Guter, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, th thanks, thanks. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Adina came out strongly there. And uh, I, I probably would just summarize with one. I probably would not take all those but I will summarize with the one. I will summarize the first one you have. Integrity. Integrity. Yes. If you try to unpack integrity, integrity, it's it. It's, 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 it, can't, it can't be anything else, team. And uh, I probably use it a lot in the classroom. And I tell my students, you could be an A-class student, A-class of 90s, but you don't have, you have no integrity. I have no time for you. So my thinking is, Ethics, integrity covers all these because integrity is one which builds us. It's the one which will make us confidential. It's the one who will make us not say whatever. I think they're a bit too, a bit many, uh, with all due respect. I would summarize by one word: ethics. Uh, sorry, I would summarize by integrity. Uh, I'm okay, and then you write this here. I did present. I did have a short presentation. And if you notice in my presentation, it had the word integrity. My notes, all my notes, all the presentations just come from that is around doing our presentation. It must have the word integrity. I think it defines us. It defines right. us. It defines what we do. Great, great. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have um, one word summary of ethics, uh, Prof. Gitaro. You can quote him. And then mm -hmm. um, if you run in any trouble, come back to him. He can defend you by all means. But I think uh, the point <laughs> you have made is really clear. Um, I think I can now defend you. Yes. Integrity is, uh, is uh, very, very essential. Um, and that happens often when no one is watching you, actually. Exactly, Brian. So exactly. What, what, what happens? Okay, I come to you, uh, Dr. Arthur. What? What do you have anything to add there? Okay. Do you have any disagreements? Yes. Yeah. So I, I am looking at the kind of things you have on the thing, and I'm looking at it from two perspectives. So mm -hmm. innovation is an output, innovation is a process. And I think when we are trying to define ethics in innovation, we need to also look beyond the outputs. So a lot of the things I see on the um, slide you showed us are focusing on the outputs. It's like we are measuring um, innovation based on um, the publication, um, the subjects. I, I think that even in the motivation for innovation, why you come up with the innovation, there is or there are some ethical issues there. Um, if your reason in coming up with an innovation is, is not right, um, then, it could be something that is benefiting other people, but it's something that can be questioned. Um, I like the openness, um, the carefulness. They suggest um, some, the process. Um, I, I would add inclusivity because um, having people tell you what you need and what is good for you and not involving you in the process in itself does not make innovation ethical. Um, there's, there's a need to um, also scrutinize the process of coming up with the innovation when we are trying to look at um, whether it is responsible, it's ethical, and all of that. So um, that is what I would ask that we, so we are looking at the um, intended consequences, the unintended consequences, the broader implications to society, to environment, 
And we are also looking at the process in getting there and questioning even our motives um, for the innovations that we are coming up with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will, I will, the next thing now, I will start with you. Let me, let me start with you, um, Dr. Perrin Arthur. Um, I sent this topic to you. And of course, I will go around all the panelists. Ethical innovation, respecting the respectables. Um, what's, what thoughts did that provoke in you? Um, okay. <laughs> respecting the respectable. So that, that, that stood out to me. And one of the questions I was asking was, what are the respectables? Who defines the respectables? So I, I have um, focused my, my research um, for my PhD and after on the topic of responsible innovation. And I think one of the um, issues, um, and I also saw later there are discussions around um, innovations that are pushed to Africa and all of that. I think that um, the, there is a need to clearly define what these respectables are. And I believe these respectables um, may also vary and mean differently in different contexts. Um, so in order to respect the respectables, we need to also understand the different contexts and how different things play out um, in different ways. Um, but I think that the focus on ethics for me was, was good. I think it's a good start. Um, and we need to look beyond the traditional definition of ethics, which is maybe um, working within the scope of the law um, or maybe working within the rules set by your organization to a higher form of ethics, which is really your conscience and the moral issues around that. And that is a bit complex because then different people may have different moral values. And so how do we ensure that um, we um, have at least something that is accepted by most people? Um, I think that there's still room to discuss some more and to define all of these because definitely the law and the rules we already have are not enough. And for most innovations, you may not even understand the consequences properly as you go. Some of it in the application, the use and all of that, new things come up. So um, I, I, yeah. I think that we are in the, in the right direction in having yeah. this discussion now, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Prof Shokri. Um... Yes, what, yeah, I agree hundred percent because the uh, the concepts vary according to the uh, backgrounds, the culture, the uh, and the many uh, other things that contribute uh, as the um, an environment for uh, accepting the the concept. So uh, we have uh, not to uh, generalize, but we have to uh, look at in uh, different contexts according uh, to the different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, Prof. Uh, Gituro, thank you, thank you, to you when you got the topic. Yeah, you know, it's very difficult to put me be among ladies because uh, we have a problem as gentlemen. We can't chew gum and walk, but I'll try to walk as I chew. Uh, I didn't want to pick from the from two perspective, respecting the respectables. Respect is a two way. In a way that. If I have a research we are doing with the with the, with the professor Dina there, I expect respect from from her, and she expect respect from me. I think it's a two way, but more importantly, I think it to have that that heart or that space, as Karen put it, to respect the values of the other person. And I'm going to the the the, the GDB, GBT whatever we call them. There they are. They have their own values. How do we do that innovation? How do we do that when you have that kind of people? And perhaps stepping back and look at our society, whether you're in Ghana, whether you're in Gambia, whether in Somali, wherever, South Africa, very, very strong in African values against lesbians and gay. So 
This is a very interesting, very dicey. Yesterday I was asked a very difficult question by a student. And, and she was really saying, how do you do research where the, the, the tradition is for circumcision of women? And how do you identify them to get your sample? But I'm saying there are certain things you have to respect. So I totally agree. Uh, that is a, is a key aspect of it. But I think what is important, as we said earlier, from innovation is what brings value in society. So if our innovation can bring change in the society for the better, then the respect will come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that is an uh, important highlight. Um, yeah, I, I, will, I will look at this again because uh, Prof. Gitro, um um, alluded to this, and, and I was coming to that question. Uh, you mentioned it again. Innovation is about adding value to the society. And so now, my next question, I start with you, Prof. Gitiro, is, is innovation always good? <laughs> you know, when you have short questions, they're very difficult to answer, but... Uh... I probably will approach it from two perspectives. One, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. It's a way to go. Uh, and, 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 and I keep putting the word creativity uh, around me for that. And uh, because we have seen changes by innovation creativity. I'll go to uh, what in Kenya we call the money transfer, the MPESA, electronic money transfer. Uh, that's an innovation. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the IP for the gentleman who came with it. In that perspective, right now I sit here, if I want to send money to the last corner you can think of this country, I can send it, which saves a lot of costs, which saves a lot of, we used to send by vehicles and God knows whether the money will reach the person. So innovation is good. However, it can also be seen if it's misused, if it's used for uh, other purposes, and I don't have a, something right now. Perhaps I could be wrong, but during COVID time, uh, and, and uh, this is probably no evidence, and, and therefore I would, not, I would like nobody to challenge me in it. There is suspicion that some drugs were really not really addressing that issue. So you see that innovation comes quickly. How do you get something in two weeks and it's in the market? And 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 and, uh, and you're there with respect to really treating COVID. So we need to be careful, and that's why Africa needs to come in very strongly. And I think you raised this in the question you had sent us. We must have standards whereby we look at this innovation, a team which looks at that. What does it mean to the society? Uh, and, and and that is, and, but how, it by and large, and and, and uh, it is a bit. Uh, not so much. I think there are more benefits for innovation as opposed to it. And, and I'm, what I'm looking at is uh, perhaps if you get innovation, like you're going to the society, which addresses some of the challenges African is having. We are terribly, terribly food insecure. African continent is terribly food insecure. How do we then see that coming is innovation really not going to GMO because we know the impact of the GMO. So that's mm. perhaps the, the call where the, we, we have to be very careful when we deal with innovation. Okay. All right. Um, as you said from the beginning, it's quite a tough one, but I have to ask you. That <laughs> is my duty to ask the question, sir. Let me go to you, Prof. Shokri. Um, the okay. same question. Is innovation always good? I, 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 I don't uh, think this because the, the uh, sometimes the um, the implementation of such innovation uh, might be uh, not good or might be in sometimes uh, harmful and mm -hmm. uh, if the innovation is uh, quite absolute so there is no restriction or limitation uh, of the uh, of the users and of the ethical uh, concern within this innovation sometimes it turn into uh, a disaster for instance, uh, everyone uh, nowadays is uh, looking for the application of the uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. And uh, we see, we see uh, a lot of uh, yeah, any harmful effects um, uh, in medicine because I'm always uh, having the, uh, 
the the example from the uh, medical practice uh, that there is the uh, lot of uh, viruses for instance and sometimes the uh, uh, the the inclusion of the uh, harmful um, uh, sites that uh, may impede the health of the uh, of the patients. Sometimes uh, you just uh, retrieve the information to treat the uh, the cancer patients, for instance, and uh, it run into a, a disaster because this uh, information is uh, not uh, the one that should be uh, implemented within this uh, uh, patient, and so on. So, as the, uh, in the innovation is not an absolute. So we do have to put a restriction from the uh, ethical and the, the implementation point of view. And of course, uh, it should uh, also uh, guided by some kind of awareness to the uh, to the people that they are going to use the, this innovation in order to be directed in uh, any, a proper track that will lead to uh, a, a good outcome. All right, thank you. I think... Um... Um, the last point you were making is very important. Innovation is not absolute. And so there is need to put restrictions around it. All right, I will still get your viewpoint. Uh, Dr. Karen, I see you nodding your head, but uh, let me hear what you, <laughs> what you think on this question. Yes, yes, I agree that innovation is a double-edged sword. I, 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 I know in the definition, it's talking about societal good. But I think that the question is, why innovate? Um, sometimes when you even innovate for nothing, when society doesn't need it, you are creating more harm, especially if it is like a disruptive innovation that is, is, is coming. I, so I, I think the, the, the thing that can help us to tell if an innovation is good or not can include one, the motivation and the rationale for that, and two, the um the components of the innovation itself and um, three we can look at how the innovation is commercialized and used and um, I, I i came by this concept of the dilemma of control colin rich um he, he was saying that when you come up with an innovation whether you like it or not you can never understand its um its intended and unintended consequences and at that moment, if you want to stop the innovation, then you realize that you are worried. Maybe this could benefit us in a certain way, but you're not sure. And if you give yourself time and people use it, it gets to a point where the innovation is locked in. And if you find out that it's not good enough, there are now consequences in taking it out of the system. And so there's always that dilemma of, is it good? Is it bad? Should I encourage it? Um, and I think that we we need to find better ways of of doing this. The the last bit that I see can help us de determine if innovation is good or not is also in who has access to it. Um, is it making one better than the other? Inequalities, power imbalances, all of those things are things that could help us know if an innovation is worth. Um, investing in. But I think the, the last thing for me is also in the definition of innovation and how we associate it with a lot of things in business. So things like um, commodification, um, consumption. And so it's like, even when there are no issues, we need to be doing something so people would buy more. That concept in itself is, is of concern to me and I think all of those things, sometimes it's good to just stop and be slow and allow things we already have to work. All right. Um, thank you very much for your thoughts on that. Um, because yesterday, the, uh, the first keynote uh, speech we had, uh, this professor alluded to um, um, the, the Swedish um, man who set up the Nobel Prize, um, Alfred Nobel, um, he invented the dynamite. Mm. Um, dynamite was used when he invented it was to, you know, in the, in the, in this part of the world, they have lots of rocks, you know, so if they want to set up, um, high, high level building, they have to break the rocks 
And so he developed the dynamite to be able to help in breaking those rocks so that the buildings can be, you know, put in the right place. Um, but um, after he did that, uh, people took it up and started using it to blow up human beings, you know, um, and that became a really a sad moment for him. Uh, so before he died, he had to set up the Nobel Prize um, to um, really recover, recover maybe his integrity or the mission he had before um, so that um, instead of destruction, peace can be in, in, in our world. So those who have contributed in one way or the other, uh, medically or in society, in different ways to bring peace awarded this this um, very high, um, I don't know, maybe some of us here would like to have, have that uh, award sometime in, the, in, in, in life, a Nobel Prize. Um, but yes, as you said, it can be a two-edged sword um, in, in, some, in some cases. But I'm happy that generally you agree that uh, innovation, um, um, if you look at it from the point you mentioned, creativity is a good thing. And uh, it, should be allowed, it should be allowed in the society. And the Prof. Gitura, you mentioned some of the things Africa is facing, for instance, we are food insufficient. Uh, what can, and, and if you look at what happened during the COVID as well, you see, and this was quite rampant. When you see really? young people developing things to wash their hands and mm -hmm. things like that, just to be able to deal with the, the circumstances we find ourselves. So from that perspective, um, it's something that needs to be encouraged. Um, but my, my next question is, of course, ethics is good if we take the word uh, Prof. Gitor mentioned, integrity. I don't think there's in any society where anybody mm, disputes with that. So innovation is generally good. Ethics is a good thing setting boundaries, but do they conflict? If yes, do they conflict? If yes, why do they conflict? Um, let me start with you, Prof. Uh, Dina. I don't know if you've got a point. Um, sometimes uh, ethics conflicted with the, the, the laws and uh, in terms of the uh, innovation, uh, which uh, guided by both uh, uh, uh concepts the ethics and law there is uh, sometimes a, a conflict between the uh, innovation and uh, ethics in terms of what uh, in terms of uh, distribution for instance is there a justice in the distribution of innovation sometimes in the in the field of medicine as well i'm always uh, be back to the uh, my background uh, there is the innovation in the uh, in the uh, the speciality of oncology, for instance, and this innovation of the drugs is quite expensive. And when it comes to the uh, implementation uh, in the uh, in the field of the uh, of the patients and uh, cure, you have to distribute it in an even way, and uh, you should respect uh, whatever uh, whatever concept of um, allocation of uh, medical resources in a proper way. So uh, uh, innovation should be again uh, controlled and should be uh, distributed uh, in a way which um, uh, which assure the ethics and the uh, beneficence for all uh, in order not to create some kind of the conflict of being of having, such a great innovation, but it doesn't reach to the to the people they uh, they need. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um. Doctor Karen. Um. Yes. Are they conflicting? They so they sometimes conflict, but they can also live in harmony, um. If only the stakeholders, um, are able to put in place the right structures and um, can control their thinking process. So the conflict usually comes in the different perspectives that the different stakeholders have. The innovator has um, his or her own 
um, perspectives um, in terms of what they want the innovation to do um, and, and all of that. Um, but sometimes um, may not be seeing beyond maybe their world. Um, the conflicts especially would come in maybe the individual interest versus the societal interest and also the environmental interest. And so sometimes those bits are not very clear in their minds. And so they may ignore that and that becomes an issue. Um, I, I think that there are times when the, the conflict is um, intentional um, and there are times when it is unintentional. Um, if you are looking at it from the perspective of um, who, who has access to this innovation? Um, is it making one um, better off than the other? Sometimes the innovator does not always know um, how people would use it and how it would disadvantage or create advantages. And, and so the, the conflicts would always be there, but it can be managed. It can be controlled with the right innovation governance mechanisms and innovation management structures and and frameworks in place. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prof. Gituro. Um, yeah. Um, thanks. What are your thoughts yeah. on this? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. In terms of uh, uh, looking at ethics and uh, and innovation, I probably put in integrity, ethics, and ethos. Uh, and perhaps going back to our starting of this discussion, that who are we innovating? innovating because we want to see a change, a positive change within the society. But step back, look at that society. What drives that society? It's integrity. What drives that society is ethics and ethos of that society. So even when we, before we even come to the stage of talking about innovation, there's a foundation. There is a basis. What defines that for society? And it cannot be wholesale, because they are peculiar within certain societies, but any society looking for something good. Therefore, if then innovation is being driven by that, and if the innovation does not lead within the society, need the society requirements, then the conflict arises. So from my perspective, even innovation is driven by what the ethos are, the ethics. And if there's a conflict, then we have a, an issue there. And what am I coming from? If we perhaps, we get some individuals, and I like the point you brought about the Dynamite. I think somebody, Emma was also trying to comment on it, which was great. If for bad intentions, as Karen pointed out, somebody comes with an innovation, those bad intentions really cannot lie within the limb of ethics. So what defines that is, am I ethical in what I'm doing? And therefore, the innovation I come up with should have no issues at all. Let's have a look all at right. it. All right, um, Dr. Karen, let me come back to you because um, um, something you mentioned earlier, you said um, when an innovation let's say innovative idea comes, you may not know where it ends. Um, if I use the example, uh, Prof. Gitu uh, mentioned that Africa is food insufficient. And somebody comes up with an idea of how to improve in this. You may not know what happens 10 years from now. Just like Alfred Nobel, uh, he didn't know that people would take up this and begin to destroy the human being. Um, but you mentioned uh, in your last statement that then we need appropriate governance around this. Yeah. Now, if I start having an idea, thinking, okay, this is what I want mm -hmm. to do, and I have a sketch of what I want to do, how do I begin to, you know, think this in terms of the governance and how those who are in the, the side of governance detect that 10 years from now, this may actually become something else. 
um, is there a possibility? So for me as an innovator, how do I think about this? And then those who are responsible for ensuring safety, how do they also come into this, this process? Okay, so I, I, I think it's not as straightforward as regulation or a law being passed or policy or something like that. So I did my PhD trying to look at innovation in the financial sector. And I was also looking at innovation in those um, doing science and technology studies. And I realized that um, the kind of governance structures and mechanisms we need are the ones we include in the innovation process and not necessarily the ones that governments or I mean people who are making policies impose on us. Um, so, for example, de facto governance mechanisms like the stage gate model is, I mean, is, is common in innovation governance, innovation management and having a loop where you are constantly anticipating risks. You are probably bringing in multiple people um, and being as inclusive as possible, because if you can think of ways it can be used, someone else may come up with an idea you haven't thought of. So if you are able to include as many diverse views as possible, you are likely to better understand this, but to also have structures that allow you to reflect more deeply the so what, the why, and to try and get to the bottom of um, multiple levels of the innovation, as well as having a system that makes you as responsive as quickly as possible so that once you see trends that this innovation is going in a certain way, you know how you can quickly come in and um, take action to avoid, you know, more um, damage being caused. These, these are all things in the governance framework that is not as easy as regulation. And in fact, research showed that um, our innovation regulations always um, happen years after the innovation itself. Because if you're coming up with new things, then definitely regulators don't even understand it to govern it. So I, I concluded um, in my research that we cannot rely on just policies, et cetera. We need to help people understand how they can innovate in the process and how they can even just naturally be intentional in caring about the future of their innovation in the process and in making sure that they are thinking of what they will do if some unintended consequences come up as, as they go. I think the point, right. she's the point yep. is maybe she's raising is important, Karen. Uh, you're right that as we look to the future, there are risk and certainty. We would like to minimize that, though, can be 100%. And therefore, as much as possible, we want that unintended of the innovation to be minimized. How do we do that? And I think I bring the question that uh, Brian is bringing of governance and probably look at it from a bigger perspective, pragmatism readership, right? That pragmatism readership ensures we have policies. And I'll take through an example, uh, the whole idea of maybe ban a, a charcoal ban. You can't, you can't do charcoal business. It's banned in most countries. So we have the executive in terms of governance, the executive comes very clearly in policy direction, right? And say this policy is good because of the effect you're having on the environment. SDG 13, we just finished course 29 uh, in, 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 and you, you saw how it was in delay. So you look at the governance, I look at governance from three perspectives, the executive, the registration, and the registration there. So we have the executive, which actually is a custodian of the law, the custodian, the custodian of the policies, they tell us. Then we have now the, 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 the what I would call the registration, which brings it to, into law. And we have the judiciary, the third one is the judiciary, which now ensures that law is followed. And therefore, when you look at the issue of governance, right, we are spot on, those three things must be in place. So when we start with a policy, no banner, no charcoal, whatever, then the executive, the, the ritual system, ensures that goes into law, and the judiciary implement that, uh, uh, makes the law is followed. Now, the reason why we are doing that is to minimize the impact 
we probably have on that because of the climate change. So there's a lot to pay here. Take that now to the innovation. In the responsible government, and I mean in a responsible government, should have, and, and, and it's interesting, you find in most law schools now, they're actually doing the law of the internet. They didn't have it, the emerging technology, the innovations in it, because it's affecting what we do. And therefore it is important to minimize those risks of innovation. It will go through the system and we deliberately have things to read it, the direction in terms of something happens, we want to minimize that. So I think yeah. it's a very important question. And my, I was looking at what are some of the key challenges where innovation can help us? I don't know how you can do it in innovation, but you look at the pragmatism readership in Africa is wanting. And I might, I might go to a country like Botswana, very civil, civilized. My word goes to other countries when somebody wins, it's total war. How do we see, how do we innovate to see a government which is responsible for the better of the society? All right, uh, Prof. Dina Shokri, I come to you. Um, I mean, you have used uh, uh, your field medicine um, a few times, and I think um, I wouldn't want you to deviate from that because it's something that affects everyone of us, so we need to be healthy. Um, now, from your own part, um, what are your thoughts um, in this? Because um, in medicine, you deal with human beings. Yes. And, and it can be quite critical in, I mean, compared to other fields. Um, yeah, but what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, you mean the governance within the, uh, yes. the context of uh, innovation? Yes, yes, I totally agree. The process should be um, from the start, uh, respecting the, um, the outcome. For instance, when it comes to the innovation, of course, it is sometimes uh, it's not the control, then just uh, an idea uh, came to your mind and then start to uh, put your uh, innovation. Uh, but when you uh, just uh, put uh, a delineation or uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, outlines for what you are going to, to do as a process for innovation, you have to consider uh, many things. Consider the um, the ethical uh, principles, for instance, in order to put from the start the plan uh, that will be uh, uh, of benefits, beneficence for the uh, for the community and for the population as whole. Uh, the the other issue um, I just uh, borrow it from uh, Karen's uh, discussion. Uh, the uh, you have to include uh, a different uh, opinions, and this is uh, might uh, open your mind to some aspects of uh, this kind of innovation and uh, how we are going to implement it in a proper way. And finally, uh, the the role or the step of uh, policies and the re regulation it is mandatory, uh, and putting the um, the ethical and moral codes of how this innovation uh, could be uh, implemented uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are you following this? Are you happy with what is going on? You are very quiet. Anyway, of course, yeah. I shut you all up. Um, so, yeah, but um, active, let me let me see your let me see your camera. reaction. Give me yeah, thumbs up if 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 I enjoy this. Let me see a thumbs up. They yeah, are very good in the chat box. I'm leading them. They are very interesting. All right. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um. So let me come to this. Uh, our time is flying. And I don't know how he does that. Um, but now these are some of the headlines that we see coming from Africa. This one <laughs> says, we are not guinea pigs, the South African anti-vaccine protesters. Medical colonialism in Africa <laughs> is not new. We are not guinea pigs. Not guinea pig. Activists slam Europe for dumping on Africa. What is the problem here? What are the issues? Let me start with you, Professor um, Dina Shoko. Okay. 
Of course, when it comes to the uh, the medicine, uh, the the concept of uh, being a guinea pig is always there. The uh, the human beings uh, always think that uh, why you tested this on me. This is why there is a lots of uh, uh, international codes of ethics regarding the uh, research on the human beings. And then comes to the local policies. We do have uh, in my country, for instance, a law number 214 for the year 2020 uh, regarding this issue uh, in particular. Uh, this might impede the innovation. Uh, in the first place, because the, the people just see themselves as rats or guinea pigs, uh, and they are going to be a subject for the uh, the experimentation, uh, and sometimes they they didn't see the benefits for themselves or even for uh, the community as whole. Um, so the um, in order to be stick to the uh, ethical code that uh, nobody is going to be uh, a subject in a, an experiment which is not of a value uh, to him uh, directly. Uh, I mean, sometimes the innovation started in the Western countries and then they come back to us as uh, a part of the uh, recruited subjects for the uh, the uh, clinical trial or the uh, the the uh, uh, experimentation on the human beings. So we have to put it into mind when uh, you are going to evaluate or review this uh, protocol for research uh, in your country, because um, I'm uh, part of and the president of one of the uh, research uh, ethics uh, committees or uh, institutional review board or the Ministry of Health in Egypt. Uh, we put into mind this aspect, multidisciplinary uh, and multi-center studies. Um, uh, is it beneficial to us? This uh, disease is uh, commonly encountered with the, within my country. If the um, beneficence and non-maleficence uh, is quite uh, anticipated, the risks and benefits is quite uh, present within this uh, research or not. Uh, just to put this, we have to balance two uh, things. Uh, we have to contribute in the beneficence to the others. So uh, we are not always a guinea pig. So we have to have the initiative to be part of the innovation. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to uh, just ensure uh, the safety uh, from the uh, the health perspective as well as from the ethical and moral perspective uh, is always there while we are implementing uh, this uh, kind of innovation and research for the innovation. Mm -hmm. All right, I come to you, uh, Dr. Karen. Uh, let me show this again. I think the participants want to see this. Um, mm. There is there is lot of this coming. I mean, if you go to the internet, you search, you see a lot of this. Africans are crying so much about it. You don't hear so much in Europe, maybe in Asia or in in South America or in America, but Africans are crying so much about, you know, um, even campaigning on the street, marching. So, yeah. what is the problem? What what have you found that is the problem? Yes, yes. So I, I mean, I, I can understand these these um, comments. And I think that um, they are all depicting this issue of inclusivity. Um, some of the questions that came to mind was who even defines innovation? Um, in our research papers, the ones we quote, the ones we tend to to establish some of these things, most of them come from the West. And so we are taking these definitions and we are imposing it on us. Um, it goes beyond even the definition of innovation to now who determines what is good for us. Um, during COVID, I remember in, in Ghana, there was one company that came up with a um, qua, qua mixture and he was using several herbs that um, apparently people had, had been able to use it and had showed that it was building their immune system to, to fight this. But um, there were lots of opposition and um, the focus was, okay, so we need the vaccines, we need this and that. 
we have several indigenous things here um, and someone comes and tells us that it's not good enough. You need this particular thing. I think there's um, an, an issue there um, that could be part of the reasons why people feel um, they are not um, being included and they are they are being used as guinea pigs. How, how relevant are the innovations that are pushed to us in our context? And even if they are relevant, how um, applicable are they to our circumstances? Um, to what extent are we involved? Do we have a say? Maybe later I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that affect this. Yes, there are some um, things on, on the ground that prevent us from being able to engage as much as we should. And, and so for me, that's why the inclusivity bits at the very beginning, I said, what I will add that is not in there is inclusivity is very important because when you are involved in something, you own it and you feel like you have also been able to use your knowledge and understanding of your context um, to also contribute to, to that thing. And I think that is what is, is missing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the point you made is very important. I cited this example yesterday, which I saw somewhere, uh, maybe on the SFI platform, that um, I'm not sure um, who went to a village um, because these women were, you know, carrying their bucket and going to the stream that was several kilometers away, and then they fetched the water. And usually they go in groups, and then maybe somebody thought, "Oh, this this is not good. I think I need to help these women." And went around the community and put the boreholes everywhere, and uh, eventually it was disappointing because the women still went to the stream to fetch water didn't use the borehole <laughs> and uh, the reason is that um going to the stream is not just to fresh water it's, it's a community mm -hmm. it's a community life that is that is how they have lived their life that is how they communicate that is how they interact so the borehole that is in front of your yard deprives you of this this benefit you have you have gained for generations. So I think the point you're making here is very important. Who defines innovation or um, how inclusive? Perhaps if they have sat down to tell the women, you know, we want to do this, um, they would have at least received some feedback from them. Um, but coming to realize that, I mean, you have wasted resources, wasted effort. It can can really be disappointing, but yeah, Prof. Good to uh, let me come back to you on this issue of the cry of the baby from Africa. We are not guinea pigs. <laughs> I think you are, you are spot on. I like your narrative that uh, it's not just going to fetch the water, uh, but you can make it a bit uh, comfortable instead of going some kilometers. And and the story be told that. Uh, uh, once upon a time, I used to work for the World Bank, and you had this debate in northern Uganda, the Kamara Jong people, and uh, uh, the bank was very clear, we want to do classrooms, and uh, a lot of disbursement. And the community said, no, we don't need classrooms. We need a cow, cow dip. We need a dip for our cows, because that's what will help us to do the classrooms. And uh, there the World Bank went ahead and did the classrooms. And uh, the cows were sleeping in those classrooms. So never until God what they needed after. But I, I don't want to look at it from two perspectives, the issue of the guinea pigs and the issue of the dumping. Uh, we, we, we take responsibility. As Africans, we should take responsibility. A big part is us. As Dina pointed out, we should be part of that innovation. But we shy away. We stay, we want to stay in our own cocoon. So we must take first the first is to appreciate there's a challenge here and they have to take the responsibility. Uh, nobody, nobody came to reprimand Bill Gates when COVID kicked in. He said Africans will die in millions. That was unheard of. That was irresponsible. Thank God, because of our feeding system, our crops. But if you look at dumping, the very good example where good governance, strong leadership take responsibility. For those who are familiar with AGOA agreement, it's very clear 
African countries to get that opportunity to export goods to the US must, must buy the second hard clothes we are talking about from, uh, from, from, from the US. And Kagame, with his leadership, came and said, yes, that's fine. But, <laughs> but we are going to increase the tax. Kagame's thinking was, we are why dumping clothes in, in Rwanda and we are killing the local manufacturing? And that has been a very deliberate move by the developing economy, killing the local economies. So he said, fine, it's, uh, I'll push it, I'll double it. Of course, the, the, the US stopped uh, that. And what I'm trying to say here is the leadership takes that responsibility and goes back to the discussion we had about the governors. The issue of being uh, guinea pigs, I think in my view is very important that we, and, and Dina, you are spot on, the idea of joint research. Whether in Egypt, Zambia, whatever, we have, we understand the local content. We understand what the community is looking for. So responsible government, that should be the first criteria. Right? We're doing a joint research, and I'm a person of joint research. It makes a lot of sense because we bring new ideas from the North or the South and us ourselves. So my point here, perhaps, it is important that we start, and I think, uh, uh, Bright, this is a good idea. Let's make this more to the African context so that if you have any research, then we can do it in the North. Indeed, oh. who understand more challenges? Who understand the challenges in Africa? than we are. We are researchers here. But I think we have let our, country, our continent down. As whether you're in medicine, whether you're in whatever, we probably need to step uh, forward and engage more in terms of doing research. And probably something we, we adopted when I was in government. Fine, looking for development space. We said, fine, we have these people who perhaps can come and work together as a team but 40% of the work which must be done must be local content. Oh. It must be local content. So, for example, if you are doing research, why can't we say among the researchers, two or three must be from Africa? And that can be a responsible government that can be put very clearly. You want to do research in Africa? Then these are the conditions. So, yes. no one can see those kind of statements because they just walk over us. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think uh, this is also an aspect that we, we need to discuss deeply because um, there are several things that can happen um, when we talk about joint research. But I agree with you. Um, if it's centered on the first point you made, both sides integrity, both sides integrity, I think. Absolutely. Um, it's Absolutely. It very beneficial. Uh, my... Timekeeper is telling me I have five minutes, which is a pain um, because I still have some things that um, we need to um, look at. But uh, I will give you a few seconds to look at this. I will start with you, um, um, Professor Dina Shokui. Can ethics be an impediment to innovation? How and why? I will go through you and then I will come to my last question later after this. Okay, let's Professor Dina. Yes. Um, ethics, of course, is, uh, is uh, quite uh, important, not only for innovation, but uh, the interaction, the human interaction within the, uh, the context of uh, the practices. So um, everything uh, should be guided by the um, some kind of uh, limits the limits uh, the uh, should be stated in the first place and the, in order to uh, to have the goal of what you are going uh, to do or you are going to uh, innovate and um, one of the issues that i'm usually uh, confronted with that uh, sometimes especially in the young generations the innovation is quite uh, absolute there is no uh, room for such uh, uh, innovation, mm -hmm. and they uh, they always um, yeah, and you see the the innovation that it's by itself is a quite good things, and no need for uh, other restriction, and any other uh, limitation that we put 
um, in terms of the ethics is considered as um, crippling uh, a, a process for what they uh, think for. Um, so uh, I do think that we have um, always make balance between the uh, crippling limitations uh, for uh, innovation uh, to be uh, out of the sky and how we can use uh, some kinds of uh, codes or uh, of uh, controlling uh, aspects uh, in order to put, to put this uh, innovation in a proper way. Okay, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, there will be time for questions. Um, I'm not reading the the uh, chat. I'm not reading it because I don't have the energy to go in a between. But if you have any question, you have any contribution, um, I will take a few um, and I will take it first come first up. You can put up your hand there. I will come back to that later on. Um, but let me come to you, um, 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 Dr. Karen, the same question. Can ethics be an yes. impediment to innovation? So, okay, so I think ethics should not be an impediment. What could be an impediment would be um, the kind of policies we put in place and how we enforce it. Um, as I, I mean, I emphasize um, user centricity in innovation. So there's, there's a need to actually understand your users and to take care of them in coming up with innovative ideas. Um, and this includes the society and the environment. They are all stakeholders. So actually ethics is good for innovation. I think I saw in the comments something about society kicking out your innovation if you don't put in place um, the right um, ideas. It can last. So in a way, ethics is actually good and sustains innovation, but we need to be flexible because we can't understand it all. So it is in the governance and um, how we go about the governance. And I, I, I think regulation is not the way to go where you are only coming up with policies. We, we, we need to experiment with other forms of governance that gives power to the innovators themselves so that they regulate themselves aside the other um, things. Um, that way it doesn't become stifling. It's rather for, for the good of, of society. Yeah, I think that is quite important uh, because last week uh, we received a circular um, in my center and my boss was emphasizing it. She's doing lab work. So she works with animals, uh, but I work with human beings. We have clinical samples we collect. Um, but the institute sent out the circular that there is um, what they call secure environments where you need to put your research data, you need to put it there, you need to analyze it there. And then she said, everybody, uh, Bright, you and your group, you're working with human samples, you need to do this. So I looked at it and uh, the next day she asked me, have you started looking at it? I said, well, it's not that simple. Goodness. <laughs> it's, it's not that simple. You see, you can bring um, this policies but practically you need to think about it it's not simple to take my data this can take more than a year to do that because we have which data have been collected over years and the fact is that what structure is this system what structure do we have okay so i, I think i like that part you mentioned about um the responsible governance this okay prof kituro let me come to you yeah. with some question, can ethics be an impediment to innovation? In, in, indeed it can. Indeed it can. And it, if it's in conflict, if the ethics, if the innovation is not, is not in conflict with the ethics of the society, then there's no problem. But innovation, if innovation is in conflict with the ethics of the society, it can't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. So it's important as we do innovation, and it's great. I think that's we all saying it's a good thing to do, but we must also realize, and I keep repeating this like a broken record, we must realize that it has a purpose. There's a need, a need for it, and that need is to make the society better than it is. 
my bottom line is what drives anything we do is the integrity we have within the society, is the ethics we have, whatever happens, and is in line with that, then there will be no impediment, there will be no conflict. Mm. All right, I have I have gone over my time with two minutes, but um, I have to ask this. There's no how we'll end this discussion without um, asking this question. I hope it is my last question, but uh, moderator or, or our timekeeper, um, don't be offended if I ask the second one. So this is the main thing uh, we have been talking about. This. So I will go through the speakers to ask them the most important question from all we have discussed now. What is ethical innovation? Um, so let me start with you, um, <laughs> Professor Gitoro. What is ethical innovation? Hmm. Perhaps unpack the two. Ethics, ethical, it has to do with our values. Being ethical, doing the right thing. Last year I was, I was in Hamburg last year in November for a week conference and uh, we are given a train ticket for seven days, nobody checked whether we have the ticket because they are ethical. They know you not get to the train without the ticket. And that was to me, was very telling. That's somewhere ethics drive the society, the values, the integrity drive the society. So if we can then bring that into innovation, then that innovation is for the benefits of us because it has carries our values with it. So they are related, but I keep saying the one which drives the other is what this ethics are all about. It's what the society is all about. That drives the innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Prof, I mean, this may be funny, but uh, the example you have used uh, makes me to, re to remember when I lived in Finland, we got a story of this African boy who was uh, dating a Finnish girl and then he did something that was against the law and the girl called the police that um, her boyfriend was uh, doing something wrong and the police came and arrested him and uh, after some time she went to say I want to bury my husband so <laughs> you can imagine all right so so value values of the society all right let me come to you uh, Dr. Karen what is ethical innovation? Okay, so I, I would say that ethical innovation is innovation that does not compromise the well-being of the vulnerable in society, um, future generations, um, the environment, stakeholders who cannot talk but also um, are impacted. Um, it's about um, innovation that does not exacerbate in ex um existing inequalities, um, ethical innovation, um, acknowledges power imbalances, imbalances in resources, and makes sure that in the process and in the outputs, people are not disadvantaged because of what they have or do not have or bring to the table. Um, it, it really is about innovation that is, um, flexible, but also um, has the needed structures in place to ensure that we can understand where the innovation is going and we can act quickly to make sure that the, the, the original purpose of innovation, which is benefits to society, to environment, is upheld. And, and um, at the end of it all, it is the kind of innovation that also is not transactional in nature, but also highlights the relational aspects. It's concerned about care to human beings, care to society, care to environments. That relationship aspect is not missing, but is at the mm. core of everything that is done. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, uh, finally, Professor Dina Shokri in your own world and you understand what is yeah. ethical innovation yes ethical innovation um, is uh, from the start uh, we uh, just uh, put uh, a goal that uh, carry a beneficence uh, for all 
So when it comes to the uh, the first preliminary um, delineation and the consolidation of the idea, we have to put the uh, benefits for all and the fairness, of course, for the distribution of the uh, outcome of this innovation. And uh, then uh, uh, we have to put the uh, uh, within the context of the of the process of uh, innovation, the um, put the ethical rule. Uh, did I'm going to test it on whom and uh, this test will um, finally bring the results that I can implement this uh, innovative material in a proper way or not. So uh, simply uh, it is the uh, innovation that uh, goes to the human beings and uh, in a fair and uh, equitable and uh, 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 benefits for all. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I have I have to give you, I have to ask you to give me your final thoughts um, because the topic is in two parts, ethical innovation and respecting the respectables. In a few seconds, um, from the discussion we have had now, what are your uh, final thoughts um, about that second part, respecting the respectables? And within the context of Africa, the implications that may have for innovation. Let me start with you, um, Dr. Karen Arthur. Okay, thank you. So my final thoughts, I, I agree with um, Prof. Gituru um, that we need as Africans to wake up. Um, I started earlier by saying we need to even define what the respectables are. I think Africans need to better understand their context so that when we are in discussions, when we have that opportunity, we know what is within our society and the realities on the ground and to use that knowledge to shape innovation. But even most importantly, I think we need to um, find ways to have our own resources. We need to create our own research that define these things for us. We need to create our own platforms where we are thinking of innovations that work for us, innovations that are linked to um, our people, um, we need to allocate resources to support these kind of innovations. If funding for innovation is coming mainly from the West, definitely um, the West will tell us what they think we should do and what is good for us. But if we have our own resources, financial, infrastructural, human, all of that, then to some extent we can also contribute. And the last thing is we need to create systems and structures that would guide us in the innovation process so that we can be as ethical as possible, but we can also do that in a way that would be beneficial for our people. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very mm -hmm. much on that. Uh, Professor Dina Shokri, your final thoughts on respecting yes. the respectable. Yes. yes, I agree 100% with uh, Karen because uh, if you want to go for uh, forward, so we have to uh, have uh, uh, our own uh, resources, uh, whether the, those resources is from the uh, intellectual uh, aspect or from the uh, manpower uh, or from the institution that govern this uh, innovation. So if we do uh, have resources, so we can just uh, put the innovation in a proper uh, direction uh, that suits us, not it is uh, exported from the outside. And uh, uh, then we just follow uh, what they want, not what they need. So we have to uh, have our own destiny by uh, shaping our future according to uh, our needs. So this is, couldn't be achieved, uh, except if we uh, work from now to have our own vision and implement our own vision to shape our future. Thank you. And finally, Prof. Gituro. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll pick from what uh, Dina said. Yes, Dina, thanks for bringing that to our vision very strong and our, our effort. Uh, but let me step back. Uh, Karen have a different view of funds. Uh, it's always used as an excuse. I don't think funding to me is a problem. 
coming with a good bankable project is an issue. We don't want to sit down and think through, come with something which, didn't I say, addresses the challenges we have in Africa. Four challenges, food insecure, deficiency in the infrastructure. You want to go to Cameroon, to Nairobi, you have to go to Europe. Thirdly, water, we can't have water. Fourthly, responsible government. If we have, that's what is killing our society. Now innovation kicks in. That's how do you do smart agriculture? If an information, and no doubt here, my brother, and everybody here, the issue on innovation is a must, but must be directed by what is challenging our society. AU, as a European Union, has a responsibility. And I think we need to knock and push and push to them. How can we, at this stage, be importing food? Research, money can be found. We spend a lot of billions, Karen, with all due respect. We spend a lot of billions in doing elections. It's a for research, but we must, as scientists, we must, as innovators, we must, as academia in Africa, demonstrate that this will bring food security in Africa. That's what I'm taking. And last one here, very interesting. Yesterday, Nairobi University, where I teach, has a Silicon Valley Innovation Park. And it's just about 36 million US. And this is addressing the issues we're having of unemployment in Africa, the youth. How do we get the university youth? This money is already found there because we had to push for it. So Karen, I hear you, but money follows good projects. Let's think through, let's leverage on uh, emerging technology, let me do innovation, and we can change this continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I think that is a very vital point. Um, and I've heard it actually also from industry players who will ask, I don't know what the researchers are doing, so I don't know what to form. Right. And, and, and that is quite important for us who are here to note. Okay, I have one hand. Uh, my time is and they're knocking on my door. Um, I have um, uh, Samuel Abanibe, if you can make it brief, let's see if we can answer your question within the scope of what we have. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Prof, and thank you for the uh, the panelists. The, this is very engaging and very inspiring. And of course, as a scientist myself, yeah, I've been thinking through what I was going to be able to get done to make this thing really, really uh, work. Now, I want to take it to back to uh, to the panelists, especially uh, Prof from Kenya, that uh, the issue of governance has been a challenge, personally to me, when you talk about uh, doing innovations. And ethics is one of the key things that we know as scientists. Can we take the concept of ethics back to the governance? Why we teach them or preach to them the gospel of ethics so that they can help us to manage our funds? The funds are there quite well. The funds are coming up from different angles. But I see mm -hmm. the angle of ethics as a challenge to our governance, to our leaders in Africa. And they are the one actually uh, impeding scientists not to do what we need to do at the right time. So I have a lot of issues on this, but I want to rest my case for now. Thank you very much for this uh, <laughs> panel. Prof, I don't know if you can finish just today. I think there is another round of uh, panel discussion. But uh, yes, if you can take two minutes to respond to that, let's see. OK. I think he addressed to the professor of Kenya. I'm not I'm the two here. Thanks, Samuel. I think, Samuel, if you listen to the four things I said, the bottom line, whatever will happen is pragmatic readership. If it's not going to happen, forget it. Now, take an example, Samuel. About three weeks ago or a month ago, Botswana did what is what they did it. Botswana did it. Why? Because the people, and this is why we need to go back. We must provide civic education to our people. That's it. Constitution 2010 in Kenya was we voted no by the churches. The churches had convinced our parents that the constitution is not good. We professionals went back to the village and our parents were saying, we educated Bright, we educated Karen, we educated Dina. Let's take what they're telling us. They're not hiding us. And that constitution was voted yes by the Kenyans by going there and doing civic education. Samuel, everybody in this panel, you have a responsibility to go back to where you were born and convince this readership is taking us nowhere. This is a readership because it's addressing the challenges which face us as a country. 
Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you see, um, I'm just looking at my questions. Um, let me see how many I was able to ask. I have 14 of them, <laughs> and uh, I was able to address six. It means that uh, we didn't even cross the half mark, but um, it has been a very engaging discussion, relaxed. Um, the fundamental issues have been touched by a very excellent panel. Um, I am really grateful to to you, the audience that have remained calm. Um, having one question only means a lot that um, you were there in the in the midst of the discussion. Thank you for um, taking part. And to our panelists, um, I want to thank you very much for uh, giving us your time and uh, bringing up these issues. As you can see, we have quite a lot to discuss in this. Um, SFI is full of young African scientists who want to learn the right ways of doing things and make an impact in the continent. Um, so this has been quite useful. So thank you, um, Professor thank you. Shokri, uh, who has joined us from from uh, Egypt, Egypt, and uh, Professor Gituro Wanaina, who has joined us from Kenya, who will be joining us again in the afternoon for the workshop. And then uh, the last but not the least, our young, uh, she's our young, our young uh, <laughs> doctor in the midst, uh, Dr. Karen Arthur. Thank you very much. Uh, she's joining us from Ghana. I appreciate your efforts. Um, um, we, we say in ASFI, we don't call you once. Um, once we call you, we invite you again. And then, uh, Professor Gitore, you know that is the case. I told you, we'll come back to you and I will yeah. keep to those words. So, I give you my you, word. Uh, I will give you my word. I'm always there. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dina Shokri and uh, Dr. Karen Arthur will come back to you again. I appreciate your effort. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, the anchor and timekeeper, um, um, I finished one minute earlier. So I think you have to thank me too for keeping to the time. Uh -huh. Thank you, everyone, for, yeah, for, for this. Am, am I not make it in the afternoon, uh, Brian? Am I there? Am I supposed to be in the afternoon? Yes, in the afternoon, the workshop. Am I presenting something? Yes, of course. Oh, no. Mm, but said something quickly. Yeah. And, and see my slot. What, I can't remember what presenting on something. What am I presenting on? Oh, you don't, you can't remember. You're presenting on enhancing skills for research innovation. Okay. Okay. That's the workshop. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the time you have for that, let me see. Uh, the time we gave you is, um, so this is from 12, 40 and to 130 GMT. We are ready to pass. Here is already. Uh, okay. GMT. Here is already. Yeah. GMT. So, so okay. 1240, 1240 GMT to 130 GMT. Oof. Okay. Let me see what I can provide uh, at that yes, particular prof. time. We, okay. we would, wouldn't run from that. We have to have it out, oh, Prof. Oh, Many people are looking forward to that. Karen, okay, thank you, you very much. Here, Karen. Karen, help me here. <laughs> I hand over to you, our anchor. It's a new talk here. Help me, Karen, here. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bright, for this wonderful uh, session. It was mind-blowing, educative, insightful. And you could see the question, very insightful discussion. Indeed, it is very insightful discussion. Thank you so much, all our panelists, and thank you, uh, Dr. Bride, for your coordination and was able to bring out the best out of them.